Hello everyone, um, I'm Alex or it's MG on Reddit and I'll be your host for tonight. Um, on the podcast we have Arthi, Clockwork underscore Watermelon. Uh, and Keaton, Strensum's Tooth and Can. Uh, so tonight we're going to be talking about um, like music videos and I don't know, just all sorts of stuff about music videos. Um, to start off though, we're going to talk about the music we've been listening to as always and I think Arthi was going to start us off. All right, so this week, um, I posted in the general discussion this week, and I already said this. I said something like, um, I've gone from person who's never listened to Modest Mouse to insufferable Modest Mouse fan in, like, under a week. And that's what happened. I got back from a trip last Thursday, and I immediately listened to, because Keaton told me to listen to, The Lonesome Crowd West and The Moon in Antarctica. And, um, they kind of, I guess, like, I listened to The Moon in Antarctica previously a couple of times, but it never really clicked for me until after I'd listened to The Lonesome Crowded West. Mm. So I guess, let me start there. Really? That album? Yeah. That just strikes me as odd, because, like, I don't know, The Moon in Antarctica makes so much more sense to me. I don't mean, like, I don't like The Lonesome Crowded West. I I haven't really spent much time with it, but I just, like... I don't know, that was really quick to come to me, and I feel like that's more common, so it's just surprising to hear you say that. Yeah, I don't know. Especially I just from the background of uh, stuff, so the first... Yeah, so, like, Maybe. the first... Oh, yeah, I was saying just from, the, like, the background of an indie fan, pretty much, like, just traditional indie from our standpoint in this generation, like, Moon and Antarctica is just, like, a much more fluent record to us, um... And Lonesome Crowded West may seem more abrasive, um, but I don't know. My first record for them, and personally, Modest Mouse are my absolute favorite band, like, no doubt about it. And um, This Is a Long Drive was my first record. I just started from the front, you know, just from the start. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, that's prob- that's quite possibly their most abrasive album, if you don't count Sad Seppy Sucker. Mm. Yeah, so, um, anyways... I listened to The Lonesome Crowded West and, like, the very first time I listened to that. I know that's kind of weird because a lot of people, it seems like that one's the one that doesn't click for them. But the first time I listened to it, like, I thought it was incredible. And, like, I listened to it. I've, since last Thursday, not like the Thursday it just happened, but the Thursday before that, I've listened to the album at least once every single day. Like, I like it that much. Mm -hmm. But it's just, like, it's, like, something I really like about it. I forgot to write notes, but something I really like about it is that, like, there is a lot of juxtaposition in between the songs. Like, there is, um, for example, Long Distance Drunk, and then, shit luck right after that and Mm -hmm. they were both kind of like just completely different sounding songs and I guess the sound is so varied and so like interesting and also like um the lyrics I guess I sort of listened to more than I listened to the moon in Antarctica before but I listened to the moon in Antarctica afterwards and then that sort of started to click with me too. Before I started, like before, I only thought the stars or projectors was like a really good song, and I didn't really pay attention to the rest. But like, I guess now, uh, I started to appreciate more of the sound. Oh, I guess it's just as varied as the Lonesome Crowded West, but mm-hmm. I guess the Lonesome Crowded West for me edges it out a little bit because of how it's more abrasive. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, like, the cool thing about the songwriting on The Lonesome Crowded West, and this is kind of there for the moon in Antarctica, too, but with The Lonesome Crowded West, I mean, you mentioned the juxtaposition between songs. There's that juxtaposition in songs, too, and that's just, like, such an interesting approach to writing songs. Like, right off the bat, Teeth Like Got You Shine, it's just, like, explosive, punk, like, weird, hard, early indie rock, and then, like instantly after that it starts to slow down and then it hits like another point where it just like really um kind of uh just like arpe- arpeggiated and very um 
dis dissonant is the word I was looking for. It's very dissonant and like they just there's all these different patterns that he hits and like basically just writes multiple songs and yeah, one. it's really interesting. I don't know a lot. And one it, thing I like, really like about times where it does very both much albums like, and I also listen you know, to or punk, but punk. Go ahead. Sorry, did I interrupt you? Because I couldn't hear you. Um, oh no, that's fine. All right. right. One thing I really like about both albums, and also, I guess, I listened to these two, and then I also listened to This Is A Long Drive, but I didn't listen to that one as much, and I'm going to have to listen to it more. Mm -hmm. But one thing I like about, I guess, all of their stuff is how they use, like, weird guitar sounds, like how they do harmonics and stuff Mm -hmm. and all that, and I just really appreciate that. It sounds really cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah he's that, he's that's, that's definitely my favorite part about moon antarctica actually like i don't know that or that's what made me fall in love with the album initially just songs like god i can't think of any of the songs perfect titles, disguise but, like, yeah like perfect that's the one disguise, that i can think of. perfect disguise um it's one of the earlier tracks it's like it kind of makes me feel like everything has yeah it makes me feel stuff. like i'm floating but it I don't know, it's weird. Yeah, it's like, it sounds like they're like, not playing it backwards. Like, not floating in a good way. Like, floating is such, like, it's so stereotyped as, like, such a positive feeling, but it's, like, it's more, like, drifting and not being able to stop, and it's really cool, but mm-hmm. also is incredibly depressing, and I hate listening to it. <laughs> <laughs> it's, um, like, I like the thing they do where they make it sound like they're playing backwards. Yeah. yeah. I don't know oh, what yeah, that's called. Kind of the reverse hit really like uh he just had i mean you can get um pedals that'll actually reverse the sound of your guitar but i'm pretty sure since this was like 2000 and i think it was recorded in the late 90s um they were probably just doing tape loops and like reversing the guitar but yeah i don't know he, they they really mess with a lot of sounds on that um if you read into the history of the album like uh he was behind um the guy who um produced it i can't remember his name right now but he's the lead singer and like the main man behind the band caliphone um and he was engineering everything and isaac brock would always just like be standing behind his shoulder when he was mixing and stuff and he would be like i want to sound this way how could you do that and like they would they would just flesh it out and he would remember those things and start to do them himself behind the panel and like so he had his hands in that very much and he knew what he wanted from the moment uh it started there's actually a lot of weird things that happened behind the moon in antarctica like um while they were recording it he got got his jaw broken because uh he was just like out celebrating and getting drunk and he's just such a friend he said i'm a a friendly drunk so he went um up to these like kids in a um park right across the street from the recording studio and he was like oh hey what's happening he just kind of wanted to step out to smoke and they were just like hey f you cowboy and just smacked him in the face and broke his jaw (laughs) he had to have his eyes shut Oh he had his God. job wired shut while making that album. So there, um, from the way I understand it, there was a long gap in that album where he wasn't able to sing anything. And like, wow. um, I think that has to do where with some of the just absolute um, uh, misanthropy that's on that record. Like what people yeah. are made of. Some of the lyrics oh in that God. song just like. Uh, he basically says that we're made of nothing but water and shit like that's how the album ends and that's just like oh my god and it's cool because there's a lot of really beautiful messages in that record like it's a very existential album so there's a lot of moments where you're like wow that's that's so true like uh just all these just all these really lush beautiful messages and all these weird surreal stories like wild pack of family dogs and like i mean life like weeds is just like there's this long um lyrical rant basically going through like um all the people you've met and you'll see the faces of the people you know when you die i don't remember the actual lyrics but like he goes through this weird pattern with them and that's personally my favorite song on the record and possibly my my all-time favorite songs there's there's a song there's a song on that record I can't remember which song it is um it's it, he he kind of talks about like like um living through the television in a way uh, do you know what I'm talking about it's like 
I don't know if it's Tiny Cities Made of Ashes, but it's around then in the album, and it's just like, I don't know, it just felt so intense and misanthropic to me, and like, it just stuck out to me from the beginning. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, uh, yeah. It's weird how, um, both of those records are just like surprisingly negative, considering yeah. like, the only song I heard before by them, like the only song I heard before listening to these two records was Float On. <laughs> Float On. <laughs> I, I, I think Float On might also be kind of bitter in its own secret way. I mean, that's just my assumption, but... Um, Alex, yeah. I think the song you were uh, mentioning earlier was probably the cold part. Uh, so on this cold, cold part of the world. Or it could have yeah, been a different city, no, which I is think, right after I, I think city. it's a different city. I mm-hmm. really think it's a different city, but I'm not 100% sure. I haven't listened to the album in a little while. How they run this so, show, so sure run it into the ground. That That's one of the, the main lyrics. In the, I don't know. That's a yeah. There's a lot of stuff like that on that album. It's a very... It's, it's strange. Oh, yeah. It's so, yeah, the line that always stuck out to me was I, I'm gonna look out the window of my color TV yeah I yeah remember to remember to forget you forgot me I'm gonna look out the window of my color TV like that just always struck me as so like as just one of the most bitter statements I've ever heard mm-hmm. just in like in kind of a self-loathing way and also kind of like a society loathing way and like I don't know I mm-hmm. just I've and just the, the nature of like how much we watch tv like just oh yeah that alone like just sitting yeah. on your ass in front of the television yeah and i like that isaac brock is so critical of things like that like he's very very quick to observe about things like that recently there was an interview um where it was a foreign interview and um somebody was asking him Oh, oh, you live in Portland now, so, like, that's the city that um, is proud of being weird or something like that. And he just, like, went off about it. He's like, I don't want to get too much into it, but keep Portland weird is just total bullshit. It's basically just allowing people to go crazy. Like, the other day, I had a, I've had to chase, like, multiple people out of my house with an axe and, like, all this stuff. And, like, he's just very critical of all cultural yeah. things, and I like that a lot. And that's actually on the moon um, – or, no, Lonesome Crowded West a lot. I think it's on both records, really. I mean, really I think most of his music in general. Yeah, I think I think uh, the Moon in Antarctica is a lot more introspective, but and mm-hmm. so there's probably more of it on Lonesome Crowded West. But I don't know. Also, going back to what I was talking about earlier, my favorite Modest Mouse line is in a different city, and that's I'm watching TV. I guess that's a solution. <laughs> it's just like, oh my god, that that that's just that resonates with me so much, and. And it just, like, it hurts. <laughs> you know? <laughs> it hurts. Um, but yeah. Sorry, what were you saying? I don't um, know. I, was I feel just like thinking... I interrupted you, but maybe I didn't. Not at all. But, like, yeah, I, I was just thinking about the Lonesome Crowded West and, like, um, the overall themes on that record of just, like, how there are certain parts where it's very romantic towards the road and like travel and stuff like that. Like truckers Atlas, where he's like talking about almost like a weird romanticization of road pavement and stuff like that. But then the rest of it, he's just like very, very bitter towards the paving of the West and urban yeah. development in general. And I like that. I like that he can find like beauty even in the things he hates, but he still very, very much adamantly hates them. Yeah, I, I just, just... This, is, this is totally off topic in a way, but um, I just remembered, like, I knew someone in high school who totally, like, lived the modest mouse lifestyle, or what I would imagine that to be that, and, like, he, I don't know, he, he was he was much more, like, friendly and idealistic than Isaac Brock would, but it kind of reminds me of their music in a lot of ways, and I'm, I'm almost 99% sure he's never listened to them, and I just think that's kind of funny, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Um, that's that is pretty funny but yeah what were, what were you saying i i'm not sure is oh I, my god i should stop mostly just just kind of babbling about the lonesome crowded west just because yeah. it's 
such such an incredible record. Like yeah. that was I've... one of those records that I listen to every day on the bus, and like it got me through a lot of stuff. And I don't know yeah. his his songwriting and the way he looks at things is just really really incredible. Um, I don't know the way he thinks about things. I really appreciate like yeah. trailer trash. I mean trailer oh, trash. Trailer trash. I, I mean so much. Oh, I made a comment about that. It's so sad. Like, I just want to give him a hug. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so and sweet. bankrupt on selling, too. Oh. Where it's just like this total emotional low, and he's just... Oh, man. But, um... What's it? Doing the cockroach, I remember. Because I was very, very vividly just sitting on the bus every morning and looking around at the people and listening to what they're talking to, and then just, like, having that play in one ear and just, like... Oh, I felt everything on that record so so vibrantly. It's it's quite possibly one of my all-time favorite records. No, definitely. Yeah. Top, something, top. Yeah. Something that um something small that I liked about it was like for example, like on the song Cowboy Dan, which is like a really sad song. But like just that one line where, like, the line that he keeps repeating, Cowboy Dan's a major player in the cowboy scene. I just think that's really funny. Yeah, <laughs> that's just a really funny, funny line. And, like, I, I don't think I've heard that song before, though. I, I should really get around. Like, I, I really want to get, um, not the Lonesome Crowd of Blast, but I really want to dive into, um, this is a long drive for someone with nothing to think about. There's um, a lot on that record. It's yeah. a, it's a really interesting strange record like dog paddle on that song they literally just switch instruments and all play the like isaac plays drums and eric judy plays guitar and jeremiah green plays guitar or jeremiah green plays bass and it's just like this weird clusterfuck of music yeah but arthi what were you saying about Um, cowboy dan i don't know i just really like that he can I don't know if that was supposed to be funny. I just thought... I'm, oh, yeah, like, maybe no, a I lot of... I think it's like, funny. totally a funny. Lot of, a lot of people thought it was funny. Phil Eck, the... Um, he actually... So Calvin Johnson uh, of Beat Happening produced the most of the record. Um, but when they recorded um, Trailer Trash, Doing the Cockroach, and uh, Cowboy Dan, they were all, like, really out of tune, and it just sounded fucked up. So uh, he got... Phil Leck to come in, um, and Phil Leck has worked with Fleet Foxes now, and he's done, he's done a lot of stuff. He's a pretty well-established producer now, um, but he, when he produced those songs, like, especially Cowboy Dan, he thought it was really funny, um, and he had Isaac Brock explain it to him. Basically, Cowboy Dan was, like, a really good friend of his, uh, father's, but, um, like it had very little to do with him except for the fact that it was a good name for a character and just tell like, <laughs> base base off some of the people he had met like just truckers basically and just all these like fake pseudo cowboy people now who are like oh fuck the indians and stuff like that and so um yeah that's that's basically yeah. what that song's off of and then like standing in the tall grass and stuff like that um he connects that to memories he had with cowboy dan in my home state of montana um and <laughs> yeah yeah just like that's where i love that song the best probably is like after all of this rage it's silly playful but also just rage about these kind of people that you often find yourself surrounded by just basically rednecks yeah. um and like he just takes moments to be like, uh, every time you think you're moving, you just, or every time you think you're walking, you're just moving the ground. Every time you think you're talking, you're just moving your mouth. Every time you think you're looking, you're just looking down. It's just like, oh, these, these heavy moments that, you know, I feel a lot of people feel stuff like that. And um, he he was able to articulate it in a way that's probably very unexpected. That's what I love about Modest Mouse is they are in a lot of ways modest. Like Isaac Brock just has like this crazy lisp and like total Western, almost rednecky accent too. Um, but he's so articulate and he has all these surreal images in his lyricism. And, um, you know, there's still so much wit and just wisdom to him. Um, yeah. it, oh, it's just so great. I love his lisp so much. Yeah. I'm just gonna put that out there. 
Yeah, and this is a long drive. They actually tried to edit it out a lot. Yeah, so, I read um, that somewhere. Yeah. Like, yes. I read that before I listened to the band. Like, I already went in knowing he had a lisp. And I know that he tried to, like, hide it and edit it out. And they did a better job of doing that in their later albums. But, like, it's just... I just really like it. I don't think I've ever uh-huh. noticed it in their music. And maybe it's really? less present on uh, Moon in Antarctica. Oh, uh, yeah, it is. The album I've spent the most time on. It's mostly most prominent on... um. Lonesome Crowded West, because he's just streaming it, and yeah, they just recorded that. That was an album where um, they didn't go into it with any songs written. I mean, like, except for Trailer Trash, which was from previous stuff. Like, they had little bits and pieces around, but um, they didn't have, like, a concrete set of songs written. Uh, Calvin Johnson just wanted them in Dub Narcotics um, Sound Studios, so that's where it just kind of happened. Um, and it's funny because since he tried to edit it out on the first album and edited it out in some of the later albums, like a lot of people thought it was fake for a long time. Really? Like, yeah, people <laughs> thought he was faking it. And he's like, why would I do that? It's kind of ridiculous. <laughs> uh, so Arthi just pointed out in the chat that we've been talking about Modest Mouse for almost 20 minutes. Oh boy. <laughs> So maybe it's time to move I'm, on. I'm okay with it. <laughs> I, I to am too, and I and I'm sure most of indie heads would be as well. Um, but but uh, I don't know, Keaton, what'd you listen to? All right, so this week, um, one of the albums I listened to was Erica Badu's New America Part Two, kind of the Ankh, I think is how it's pronounced. Um, but yeah, I I was watching the Black Power mixtape for uh, the 4th of July and she has a lot of interviews in that film. And I knew of her work a little bit previously because of this um, kind of big mess she had with the Flaming Lips at one point. Um, I'd rather not get too into that. Um, but like, I've even more so recently been getting really into like R&B and soul and stuff like that. Um, so and I had had this album actually um, suggested before uh, on the sub. Uh, I'm not sure who you are. Someone, someone out there has mentioned how um, there are definitely parallels between this album and stuff like To Pimp a Butterfly and especially Black Messiah. So um, I don't know who you are out there, but thank you so much. Thank you. Like this record is just gorgeous and I'm, just absolutely enamored with the music of Erica Badu now. Uh, Was this specifically your first this time? Sorry. I mean, Sorry. like I said, like with the Fleming Lips thing, I looked into her, and at that time I wasn't very into R and B. And like I know she's been around and has been kind of a big part of the whole um, modern R and B world. But yeah, no, this is my first time actually really digging my teeth into her music. Yeah, that makes me really happy. She's incredible. Mm-hmm. I yeah. have never listened to her. I, I haven't even heard a single song. You oh. should listen to Baduism. It's probably my favorite by her, but I haven't been... <laughs> I, I haven't... <laughs> I haven't... I feel like if Kanye did that, the whole world would, like, fucking flip shit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a good album. Yeah, it's very... I, I'll, I'll, I'll give it a yeah, shot. Yeah, like... You should you should absolutely oh, listen no. to it she has a great voice mm-hmm. oh it's yeah really it's just like, like oh sir it's yeah she's really good she's really important to like the black music scene she's probably like i would yeah argue like, I, i'm familiar with her from like you know like studying that i don't want to say studying that sounds obnoxious but like yeah you know, being surrounded by that i guess um yeah I mean, that's why she was in the Black Power mixtape, is she put some commentary on it. She had a lot to say about um, Black Power movement and the black community, and I really respect that. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Keaton. Also, you know. one, more, one more comment on it. Beautiful, beautiful artwork. Um, oh, but another yeah. thing, another thing I listened to this week uh, was Big Black's Atomizer, and I've been a big uh, supporter of Steve Albini. He's also from my state, uh, Montana, and uh, I just, I don't know, I love his 
production work and obviously growing up with Nirvana I loved In Utero and the production on that and Surfer Rosa is brilliant and actually uh, Slint's first record Tweez which is really really underrated br- just brilliant brilliant record especially if you're into post hardcore and just weird weird shit basically um, really good record and so I mean I, I've been an admirer of Big Black before and especially Shellac I really loved um, but yeah I just I, I got back into it I got on a big Albini kick and listened to Big Black's Atomizer many many times which uh, if you're into weird punk stuff and especially Touch and Go Records like Touch and Go Records just constantly put out some of the best punk music in the late 80s and early 90s um i'm a big fan of that record label and everything they put out um and big black is a staple of it yeah could you um sell me more on that because i've i think i've listened to not atomizer but the other album that i don't want to say the name of because my parents are here but like, oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> they can't you, hear you. Don't worry. But like, I've listened to that one, and I found, um, I don't remember. Maybe I wasn't listening to that. Maybe it was something else. But as far as I remember, that album, I just couldn't get behind it because it was kind of like, sort of, misogynistic. Oh. Well, yeah, like in a certain in a certain way, but like, yeah, I can I can see where that's coming from. Um, that that's more of like a grit thing and like a punk grit thing and like basically sex and seeing sex in a very like animalistic way. And like I hate to say that too because people say that about like misogynistic music a lot. But like that's really what Big Black were going for and I personally think they achieved it. Atomizer, I personally prefer to songs about fucking um <laughs> and <laughs> effing. sex. Yeah. Um but yeah, I don't know. Sex. Sorry, I'm done. <laughs> yeah. uh, Atomizer is definitely more digestible. Um, Steve Albini as a songwriter is just like very blunt and like uh, bitter in a lot of ways, which definitely shines through on Kerosene. Um, he's on the song Kerosene. He's just talking about like um, I'm gonna die in this town. I've lived here my whole life, just over and over again. Um, and I don't know. I, I appreciate that. It, it, Big Black have a very unique sense of instrumentation to them, and that's definitely most easy to see on Atomizer. So, um, like, they're definitely, you know, a tough nut to crack unless you're a big fan of punk and, like, really appreciate the genre. But, um, yeah, I think Big Black have a certain way about them, a certain flavor that I personally really appreciate. Much like Swans, they have, like... Um, a rep- uh, repetition to them not like swans because it doesn't go on and on and on and on um though swans are brilliant and they they do what they do well um big black are just like kind of more bite-sized about it i don't know i don't know what to say much more than that okay yeah um hold on arthur do you, were you gonna Okay, so, um, I've been, as much as I want to say that I was paid to say this, I wasn't, um, but I've been listening to Beats 1, ashamedly, but it's, like, it's really cool, um, like, I don't know, for those of you that don't know, Apple launched a radio station, and they've been having artists curate programs, like, uh, St. Vincent did one, and Run the Jewels did one, Dr. Dre's doing one, um, Nas was on one for just one week to talk about uh, Eric B. and Rakim's Paid in Full, and that was cool. Yes. Um, And I've just been listening to that, and even, even like, the regular, um, the regular programs just hosted by, like, Ebro and um, uh, Zane Lowe, and, you know, uh, there was someone else, but I can't remember her name. Um, I wasn't familiar with her in the first place, so I guess that doesn't help, but, like, even, even those programs have a good variety. Like, they've got, like, 
some indie stuff in there. Not, I, I didn't hear too much, but then, and then also, like, you know, paired well with, paired with, like, some top 40 stuff, and I think that's, like, a healthy mix. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've, I've been really enjoying it, like, more than I want to say, because I don't appreciate Apple's model, and I don't appreciate, I don't know, I guess, I, I guess it wasn't really part of their streaming service, but, like, I don't know, I guess I see it as part of it, but... But yeah, it's it's been really enjoyable, and uh, Run the Jewels program was really great. I really enjoyed that. I'm looking forward to hearing more. I believe um, that Killer yeah. Mike has some truths to tell. That's for sure. Yeah, they they were mostly they were mostly funny. Like they didn't they didn't mm. go too deep into any one subject, but it was still it was really enjoyable to listen to. Oh yeah. Um, unfortunately, I missed Saint Vincent's show. Um, Aww. Yeah, I, I I woke up early enough to to listen to it, but I had forgotten it was happening until it was like five minutes from ending, so that that made me sad. But yeah, and then other than that, just like really scattered stuff. I listened to um to uh um fuck <laughs> melancholy and the infinite sadness by um by uh, the Smashing, Smashing Pumpkins. Pumpkins. Yeah. And that today, and that was really great. Um, I always enjoy that record. Uh, it's a good and then, one. Oh, I, I gave I gave like I've been giving um to Pimp a Butterfly a lot of time again recently. Oh yeah, me too. Yeah, yeah like I didn't listen to it for a while, and other pe- and a lot of people were like, yeah, I haven't really listened to it for a while, and I don't know what that says about it. But that's just normal for me. Like, yeah, I'll, I'll listen to an album for a little while and then stop. I won't like listen to it repeatedly throughout the year or anything um i i I often pick up albums again but like you know i won't like listen to it sparsely i'll like obsessively listen to something two three times a day until i burn through it which i don't know that is what it is but Mm -hmm. wait um has there been any news about the vinyl pressing because no, that's that's I've been on really my mind. Wanted, yeah, that's been on my mind too, and I haven't heard anything about it. And, but I'm I'm looking forward. We should storm Top Dog Entertainment and just be like, "Yo, when's this happening? Yeah. We need we need our Tim to pimp a butterfly vinyl." Um, that record, like obviously when it came out, I was just like totally enamored and just listened to it every day. Um, and like I took a break of about a month. And then I listened to it for a few weeks and then took a break of a few weeks and listened to it for a few weeks. It has been pretty consistent that way for me. Yeah. And right now is one of those times where I've been listening to it quite a bit. And like I'll be like, oh, yeah, good record. And I, you know, will put it on all my lists and think about it. It's always in the back of my mind. But um, like I won't actively listen to it for a while. And then something like uh, the VMA performance or this new All Right video will come yeah. out. And- It'll yeah. just, like, spark my mind again and be like, oh, I gotta listen to this record. Yeah. Uh, and speaking of the All Right video... It's still freaking perfect to me, the, the album, I mean. But the, the All Right video is incredible, too. Mm. What, what, were you gonna th- what were you gonna say about that, Keaton? I was... I, I just thought that was an, a nice opportunity for a transition into our main topic. Oh, right. Music videos. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. So we were gonna talk about music videos and not other things for 40 minutes, but, um... Yeah, so... so over the last, like, week, a bunch of music video news has come out. Like, the new Kendrick video, the new, like, Titus Andronicus is doing, like, a six video, like, a six song movie short film, short yeah. film thing. And, like, Modest Mouse video. We're not going to go into that. Like, sorry for talking about Modest Mouse for 20 minutes. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> but um, all of those things came out, and it kind of got us, like, in the podcast chat talking about music videos and their significance to music, I guess. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Yeah. So first, we kind of wanted to just, like, the history of music videos becoming a thing, like how they became a thing and then how they sort of waned but are still a thing mm-hmm. and like why that yeah okay so keen is the person who probably knows the most about that so go yeah. for it yeah so Say basically 
um, the way it first started to come about was actually through cartoons. Um, people would put different music and cartoons, which would play at the beginning of films usually, which is why in a lot of Betty Boop cartoons, there's like Cab Calloway songs. Just all of a sudden, someone starts singing and dancing and stuff like that. Uh, that's that's where it started in a lot of ways. Um, and then eventually there was something that was developed called the Scopitone, and that was a, ju a jukebox that had 16 millimeter film component, um, and just like this kind of screen where people would just make th stupid like three little three minute films to go along with the music. Uh, Serge Gainsbourg was one of the first big people to start doing this um, in France, and uh, um, Procol Harum's A Whiter Shade of Pale had a film for it, um, and a lot of them were like just pop songs and uh, surfer songs. So there are a lot of like old surfer videos of just like some some good old boys going hopping into their convertible and driving down to the beach and like surfing and just kind of fun stuff like that and uh i really um, appreciate we... it made... i really appreciate what? the fact that you use the phrase some good old boys because that's <laughs> I, it's, that's just I'm perfect. from Montana. I'm sorry. Like, yeah. Let's change this I, podcast name to the Good Old Boys Podcast. <laughs> <laughs> that's perfect. I would be way down for that. Um, but yeah, eventually that started to die out a little bit. Um, and actually, a lot of people were making films like Elvis Presley's Jailhouse Rock and stuff like that. Um, but like people were still making little films and stuff like that too. Like one um, major. Uh, musical film kind of uh, music video basically proto music video that came out was Bob Dylan's Subterranean Homesick Blues which is pretty famous culturally he's holding these signs that say different moments of lyrics and dropping them down and uh, Allen Ginsberg is actually in the background talking to like a homeless person which is kind of cool uh, and then Pink Floyd uh, got their start really um, playing the UFO club and showing these films uh, on TV, basically, these promotional films for Arnold Lane and Interstellar Overdrive. Uh, the Kinks did it too. The Who did it too. It was a big thing in Britain. Um, and then, like, obviously, that that developed. They kind of had um, TV shows where they would have people come on, like uh, the old Grey Whistle Test and Countdown and Sounds and, like, we, we all know about. Top of the Pops is another really big one like that. Um, and that, that just kind of further went on. It kind of died out until 1981 when uh, good old music television MTV launched with video Kill the Radio Star. Uh, that was the first um, the first big launch of this. What it became a huge cultural icon, especially in the 90s. Uh, Adam and the Ants, Duran Duran, Madonna, they all started it up. Uh, and it just kept gaining traction and traction and traction. Eventually they had, you know, news and all these shows where they would interview people and stuff like that. Michael Jackson's Thriller, I mean, that was up on uh, MTV. And, you know, that's a huge cultural landmark. Yeah. Um, and then eventually in the 90s, uh, what's really cool, obviously, it was a big thing. Uh, it helped uh, develop Verve and Massive Attack and artists like that, yeah. uh, British artists. And then obviously in the U.S., Grunge, uh, Nirvana broke out of the scene, Smells Like Teen Spirit. Um, oh my God. Huge, huge thing, obviously. Uh, and um, also a lot of film directors got their start in this time period like uh, Spike Jones with Weezer's music video for uh, Undone the Sweater Song. And, like, I, I, I'm a huge fan of his films, especially her. And I just love the fact that he got his start in film by going, all right, we're going to have you on a soundstage, and it's going to have blue lighting in the back, and there's just going to be dogs that run through. And that was the start of his entire career. I don't think I've ever seen that video, which is weird. Really? Yeah, it's great. I, I, I love that song, and I've listened to it a million times, and, like, obviously I love the rest of Blue Album as well, and I feel like I thought I had seen all the music videos from that record, and somehow I haven't. Uh, it's, a, it's a good Spike one. Jones I love the one for does... Buddy Holly. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's yeah, classic. speaking of Spike Jones, I love... He does really good music videos. Yeah, I loved his video for Only One, that, like, by Kanye... I, I yeah. it's it's so simple but it's so nice and really fits the song and i mean done... so simple but so nice is pretty much that song though but yeah, yeah. i think he's done a bunch of bjork videos i really yeah. like the video really? for 
I know the one he's done. One of the ones he's done is human behavior, and I like that video. Yeah, I okay. think it's yeah. cute. Bjork has some crazy videos, and I love that. Oh, I'll her newest that video that was video. really cool. Oh yeah, I just I... wanted to say that. Um, for Stone Milker, it was like uh, 180 degree one. Yeah, it, it was, was like part of her art exhibition. Hmm. Yeah. Like on Android, I think. They don't have it on Apple, and then you can also do it on your computer, but it's cooler if you do it on a phone. It's like you can move like the 360-degree virtual reality thing, and then there's just like three Bjorks around you, and oh you're God. like in the middle of Iceland. <laughs> uh, it's so great. That's cool. That's really cool. I want to see that. I, yeah. I loved I loved the video for Lion Song. Um, that 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 actually made me go and buy that record. And I haven't spent too much time with it, even though it's been months. But I really like it so far. Um. Yeah. So. We were gonna. Is that is that all you guys had to say for history of music videos? I I didn't really. Oh study yeah, that. I, I mean uh, later. Later, it kind of sputtered out. Um, MTV became overwhelmed, obviously, with reality shows, and uh, they just they just kind of spattered out. And that's actually a major proponent, personally, of what I wanted to talk about: how they develop post MTV, because now. No, not many people have their hands in music videos except the artists themselves. And often an artist can de decide themselves if they want a video at all. So this is like a huge opportunity for artists to really just go crazy in a way and like uh, it show this like absolutely visual part to represent part of their music and yeah. open a new window to it. Uh, and I think that's really exciting personally. Yeah, see, yeah, cool. I don't want to call it the post MTV age, like <laughs> I just cause that's I such feel a like, way to think about it. I feel like that's such like I guess there's like sort of some sort of weird antagonizing MTV sort of thing going on, where yeah. everybody is like, oh, MTV used to show uh, videos, and now they show like reality TV. And, like, I was born in the wrong generation. But, like... To be fair... It's not... The stuff they show is pretty dumb, most of what yeah, I've seen. Yeah, but the I'm thing not, is... I'm not gonna, like, make some comment based off of our generation or whatever from that. Yeah, I know, but... Like, the... their programming is stupid from what but I've see, seen of it. Like, it's not, like, MTV was in the prime of, like, their music videos, and then they decided to stop doing oh, music yeah, videos. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's it more was, like... It was a process. The thing oh, yeah. where, like, that little thing called the internet started to happen, and then all the videos started, like, hap like moving there instead. And, like, <laughs> why would you watch a... Like, why would you wait to watch the video on MTV when you could just watch it, like, instantly on the internet? And that's when it started to fizzle out. Yeah, yeah totally exactly. Fair. It's it's in no way a post-MTV age, it's the internet age, because we stopped watching television as much and started more moving onto the internet. Now we watch television on the internet. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, Alright, so do we want to move on to like some of our favorite music videos? That'd be cool. Yeah, we were right. kind of going into that already, I guess. Yeah, I guess so we, we can were... start with you. Oh, yeah, oh you okay. I wrote down most of the ones I um I wanted to talk about, but I just remembered one, uh, which is Once in a Lifetime. If you haven't seen that. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Um, but anyway, I, I I wrote I wrote down No Surprises uh, by Radiohead, the drama oh, okay. fan video where it's like there's like this weird like old old like like old style animation with a car that comes down from space and then there's new york i love you but you're bringing me down which is just kermit the frog singing <laughs> in very with i don't know with various like new york uh, <laughs> backdrops and then there's on gv by death on gp by death grips and the one thing i feel like all those videos share in common is that they don't try to do something big and crazy and in your face, but, like, more so just came up with something simple that that really fit yeah. the tone of the song, you know? Like, 
Doesn't on GP have two videos? Yeah, I I mean I mean the I don't even like I don't mean the the official video, which is kind of ridiculous and silly. I mean like the video that was released when they put out the song, where they're just all sitting in that sound chamber and they're just like sitting mostly still but just moving when it came naturally to them and like yeah it's just so perfect for that song especially because it's so it's like it's kind of intense and unsettling in a way just because like i don't know not not unsettling but they're just like the song is so downcast while still being you know death grips and it's just like I don't know, I think that fits perfectly, because they're in this, like, weird setting, and... I don't know. But, um... Just cool, minimalistic thing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, mm-hmm. Uh, like, I don't know, like, one music video that really bugs me, that I, I hated, um, was actually Grizzly Bear's music video for Yet Again, and I love that song, but it's just, like, it was, like, it told this whole like obvious kind of felt forced story of this ballerina and i don't know her life falls apart or whatever and she like i don't know and it just like i can't remember it because it's been a couple years but it was like it's just like it hurt my perception of the song and like i couldn't get that out of the head out of my head and then there was this one really bad fan video i watched of taste by Animal Collective, and that hurt my perception of the song, and I just, I guess I just feel like it's a double-edged sword, because you're, you're, like, you're watching this whole new component, or you're seeing this whole new component to something that might not even, I don't know, I feel like it shouldn't affect me this way, because, like, I think my, my, um, perception of the song, my perspective, I don't know, I guess, is the most important part of how i listen to it but it like yeah. it changes that because it forces you like into your head this whole idea of someone else's perception of the song and like i think that might be why i love all the videos i mentioned because like um they don't do try to they don't try to do anything big and crazy they just like really it's it feels really yeah. shaped around the song itself yeah they don't try to redefine it in any ways yeah and, I mean, some of these, some of the ones you mentioned, uh, one specifically, actually, to me, enhance the song. Like, No Surprises was oh, the yeah, one I yeah. mostly thought of. Like, it is it is very simplistic, but the, the, the music certain video, ways filmed... The music video for that song brought that song from, like, a Radiohead song that I really liked because I love Radiohead and I love all their songs to my favorite, possibly my favorite song of all time and easily my favorite Radiohead song. It just, oh, yeah. it completed the experience for me in such a perfect way, and... Oh, yeah. Yeah. Go on. And, like, to think about the way MTV had to do with all of this, like, imagine that on MTV. Imagine all the different, like, there was all kinds of music on MTV, but, like, you have your grunge, I mean, later spatterings of grunge, because this is much late 90s, so, like, Candlebox, stuff like that. You have your, like, hip-hop and R&B and all this stuff, but then all of a sudden, like, this comes on, where it's just Tom York in this weird, like, tube thing, and uh, he's just, the lyrics are, like, on the reflection of the glass. I always thought of it as, like, as, like, an astronaut helmet. Yeah, I kind of yeah. thought that the first time, too. And then it fills with liquid, and then he's just submerged in this liquid for a while, and then drains away. It just, like, so... And, like, the song is just so gorgeous and simple. Yeah. And just, like, oh, God. It's, it's like, nothing else. The colors in that music video are actually really, like, shocking. Oh, yeah. Like, it's, it's a very, very well-filmed, like, yeah. the cinematography of that simple video is just, like, so interesting. Like... I haven't seen it. I, my in favorite part is how so like, long, but like I know. Sorry. I don't um, know. No, you, you can, can go. All right. It's like it's kind of like he's drowning in it, and he's just like he looks okay. He's like he's like putting on a happy face, and that's like that's what that song is, you know, or that's oh, what yeah. it is for me, and that's that's how I've perceived the music video, and I guess you know you should find your own like perception of it, but. But I don't know, it's just so perfect to me, and it makes so much sense to me. It just really resonates, and, and I don't know, I love that song a lot. Yeah. I haven't seen that video in 
a while, and like I still remember exactly what it looks like. Yeah, I mean, oh, yeah. I mean to be fair, not much happens. <laughs> yeah, I know, but like uh, I still remember all like when you describe the colors, I just remember like exactly. Well, maybe not yeah. exactly, but just like what they are. I love how the lyrics scroll on the hood. Yeah. 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 Oh, and it's That's so like, subtle. It's perfect. It, yeah, because it's subtle. It's not like... And, like, boom. aren't they... F- they're all flipped, too, right? So yeah. it looks like he's reading them off. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, yeah. that's and so I perfect. Th- I hadn't even thought of that. Like, I mean, I'd noticed that, but I hadn't even really thought of it in that way, and that's so, so perfect. Especially you, with Murphy. the themes of the albums. <laughs> like, the themes of the albums, too. Like, the album is very focused on, like, the whole... Uh, just cut world and the um capitalism and everything around him like i mean fit or happier is basically him spattering off like television like advertisements in a weird way like it's a very personal thing but it's like a man who takes all of his medications that are sent to him on the like advertised to him on the television and stuff like that um and like i think that in a weird way i may be taking it too far um but like my personal interpretation is just like in a weird way, it's almost commentary on the whole, like, uh, teleprompter, like, thing in all television at the time, like, the news and everything. They're, they're just reading something off, and you're just, by sitting in front of a television, just watching people read stuff off for, like, hours and hours. Um, I don't know, but, yeah. yeah. And that's the cool thing about Radiohead's music videos. They're so minimalistic that you can always, always, like, fit something, your own thoughts into them. Yeah. Like, uh... Even Karma Police is just like him slowly getting hit by a car, which is yeah. like so strange. Even even just, the video for like just video. No, the, oh, the, okay, that that might be my else. least I... favorite Radiohead video actually, but I'm not really? gonna get into that. I want to talk about the Pyramid Song video because that video does do something kind of big. Like it really does try to tell a story, but it's like it's subtle enough, and it's not like. It's not using forced, obvious imagery, although it kind of is in a way, and it still works. I don't but know But it's why. not extravagant in any yeah, way. Yeah, exactly. It's not extravagant. It's just there. It's just there, I mean. and you can make of it what you want. Like, like you could find some whole big message about, like, global warming, or you could just friggin' see it as something sad that happens, you know? Which, yeah. Which I think is so perfect, but... Yeah. Although I would argue the just video is the same way because we don't know why they're laying down. Yeah, like, that's you true. You never find that out, and I really appreciate it. that's what made that so impactful. Is you know the guy's wondering like what's happening? Why are you all laying down? He's trying to figure it out, and then like in the end he just ends up laying down, and that's all we know. That's yeah. all we know. Yeah, I I do I do like that video. Uh, See the clear. thing like, is I don't I don't like hate it. even it's just not my favorite. Yeah. Um, I don't think Radiohead's ever made a bad video. Yeah. Oh, no. Honestly, all... as someone who was, like, a big Radiohead stan and, like, mostly... The Creep seen video is that interesting. I mean, yeah, it's but, like... Because like... it's just them playing. It does make sense. I'm not going to say it's a bad video. I'm just saying it doesn't do anything interesting. Yeah. I mean, I don't... You can't really talk about creep in any way. Like, <laughs> any anytime anyone's talking about Radiohead, you know, they're thinking, okay, computer. They're thinking Kid A, and they're yeah. thinking stuff like this. And then when you mention creep, it's just like, oh, yeah, I guess they were just once, like, yeah. pretty good rock band. Yeah. And, like, it needs to be noted, though, that Pablo Honey is not a really awful record. Like, everybody, it in totally the context isn't. of Radiohead, it's boring. Yeah. That's that's what it is. In the context of Radiohead, it's not good. And it drove Tom crazy to have to sing that song every time. And like Johnny Greenwood, he actually intentionally tried to screw up the song, which is why there's just like those muted, fucked up guitar like strums right before the uh, chorus hits. Because he hated that song and he wanted to screw it up intentionally, but they loved it, so they left it in. Um, and like. The Benz all comes from them being tired of playing Pablo Honey songs on tour. Right. Um, like, My Iron Lung is actually talking about Creep and I'm how, sure like, is. yeah, sir, we'll be yeah. grateful for all this yeah. fame and success, whatever. We're grateful for our Iron Lung. Um, but I don't know. Like, another music video from The Benz that needs to be mentioned is Fake Plastic Trees. Yeah. That is an excellent video. I love that video. She's so cute. I'm just going to put that out there. Which one? Tom. I think they all look really cute. Yeah, in that video. they're all cute. Yeah. 
The top just... is so small. <laughs> so dangerous. It's also just the image of being in a shopping cart that people are like, aww. Yeah. It's like a little kid. Yeah. Oh, also, like, nope. Completely lost my train of thought. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. All right, Going then. back to Are the th once in a lifetime video, actually. Like, oh, right. Oh, I, we're still talking about my videos, and you guys have videos to talk about. I'll be quick. No, the you once can in talk a lifetime about it. video is perfect, and that's all. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's kind of honestly so it's kinda David Bernie. Yeah. It's so David Bernie, and it's like, it goes really well with uh, Stop Making Sense, if you've seen that movie, which you should also watch for sure. Um, Stop Making Sense is the ultimate music video. I'm yeah. just putting that up there. Yeah. Like, the way they incorporate art in that video, or in that movie, especially with uh, This Must Be The Place, that's the shit. That's, like, honestly my favorite, one of my favorite musical performances of all time is in oh, Stop yeah. Making Sense. Yeah. This Must Be The Place. With, like, all the body parts flashing behind him, and he's dancing with a lamp. It's just, like, the perfect, yeah. perfect performance. Yeah. That's really nice. And I love, I love the big suit. When he comes out with the yeah, everyone yeah. loves that though. It's just it's so perfect, and it's like I love how he's gone for a while, and then he just comes out in this fucking big suit as like this caricature, <laughs> yeah. and he's like, like dancing and just flapping around. I I read that he had to get like special gear put on below it or something like that so that it wouldn't just like completely fall flat on his figure, and I don't know. Yeah, it's so wonderful. he like had to. Yeah, he had to, like, um, get these Japanese, um, like, weird, weird Japanese um, fashion designers to create it for him. Yeah. And, like, if you – have you seen the interview with himself? I've seen a bunch of David Byrne interviews. I think I might have seen the one you're talking about, but it's been, like, yeah. two years. It's um, great. The way he explains it, he's just like, oh, yeah, basically um, I wanted to make my head look smaller. So the oh, best way yeah. to – yeah. Make my body look bigger. And, like he just like can take something so silly and ridiculous like that and make it just something really intellectual and cool. And that's what yeah. I love about David Byrne. One of the few like certified geniuses in music and I really appreciate yeah. that. I've always thought of it more so just like and this kind of fits with the message of a lot of Talking Heads music, I think, but it's just like I don't know, like, like the suit's all big, like, he's being all big and important, but he's really just this guy, and he's David Byrne, and he's in that suit, but there was the big suit, and he's like, I don't know. Yeah, that's totally what it's about, because yeah. in a lot of ways, they have an extravagance to them, but, like, all the music are just about simple things. Yeah. Like, that's why the second record's called More Songs About Buildings and Food, <laughs> is just because it's, it's just things that they write about. I always thought it was kind of like a funny uh, critique on society. Not even a critique, but just like just like a spotlight in a way. It's like, this is what you are. Make of it what you want. I don't know. Yeah. A, a, a really, like, artful. Because they, they are, in many ways, an art rock band. Oh, yeah. I, not, I would say they're art genre. rock. I mean, yeah. I mean, they're definitely a new wave band, but they're, they're art rock, yeah. too. Yeah, it's just like an artful look at the mundane. Yeah. And like, I, I appreciate the mundane a lot. Yeah. Um, so that's one of the reasons I love Talking Heads and all their art, music videos, everything. Nothing But Flowers is such a good song, and it's got a great video too. Mm. Um, but we should move on. Uh, so, Arthi, you, you um, with us? Yeah, I'm here. Sorry, my mic was muted and I kept trying to say stuff. And you, I was like, oh my god, everyone's ignoring me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that, that happens. That happened on the Fantano podcast, or the one I was on that didn't get recorded. Oh. I think that happens at least once to someone on every podcast. That happened for the first, like, whole 30 minutes. And it was my first podcast, and I thought I was just really bad or something. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I was really, like, insecure. I was like, what if they don't like me? <laughs> oh. I was oh. going to be on the last uh, Fantano podcast, but... I, I messed up the time. I really wanted to, but when the time came, I just felt like I should give it to someone else. And also, I felt like... I don't know. I just felt like I didn't have much to contribute to the conversation. I just wouldn't be needed there. So I, I stayed off. The worst part was I had, like, a lot to say. 
and you can like sense my presence like right away. They're like, oh, Keen wanted to talk to me about this a bunch, and it's sad. Yeah. And it was my birthday too, so I was off celebrating with people, yeah. and I messed up the times. Well, and at least came you back. had fun real life times. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, that was great. Anyways, Arthi, let's talk about some of your favorite music videos. Um, I kind of jumped into this topic because I usually don't watch music videos. I'm like the person. I'm like the. Person, like the one person here who like really isn't into music videos that much like I don't know what it is they just don't really excite me I guess kind of like mm-hmm. what Jeremiah said sometime earlier I don't know whether he said it on a podcast or maybe just to us but he was like I don't want um, somebody telling me how to feel about like how to imagine music yeah that's kind and of I what kinda... I was saying earlier too. Like, yeah, it's it, it feels bad when it's like it it feels like it's telling you what the song is supposed to be, which is kind of what I felt about that Grizzly Bear video. Um, yeah, I kind of just feel the same way, which is why like most of my favorite videos are just videos that don't have anything to do with the song. I guess. Yeah. Like the first one I have on here is "Cut Your Hair" by Pavement. <laughs> like that's a funny video it i just is. and then the second one i have is drunk girls by lcd sound system they're both funny videos and oh, that's yeah. why i like them i guess because they don't really have anything to do with the song so like they don't affect my perception of the song and they're just kind of fun yeah. um, was that i kind of think that drunk girls was also spike jones i have to look into that there was some director who did that one i don't think it was spike jones um, I'm just gonna say that based on, like, just, like, it's a guess, but, like, it's an educated guess. You also have um, New York I Love You there, and, like, I feel, yeah. I feel really strongly that that video has everything to do with the song. Um, yeah, it does. I mean, yeah. that's not, like, that's why I w- didn't include it right. when I was talking about the other two, I guess, because I think it just, right. like, because, like... James Murphy does sound like Kermit the Frog, and, like... I know, it's so perfect, (laughs) because he's, like, he's, like, this big, dopey, fun man talking about really serious and sad stuff in kind of his fun, dopey way. (laughs) And it's, like, I don't know. I I guess guess that's what's there to love about his music, or for me, at least. Also, Arthi, I was right. It's actually co-directed by Spike Jones and James Murphy, the drunk girls. But there you have it. More right. Spike Jones brilliance. Those are great. The other ones I have, I think, the Avalanches, the two music videos they've done ever, are both oh. really good. <laughs> um, since I left you and Frontier Psychiatrist. Frontier Psychiatrist is just like a good video. It's like, I mean, it kind of does exactly the opposite of what I've been saying, because it has, it's entirely like oh imagining it for you because it's like literally playing out the song for you yeah i guess i think i think there are all there are always going to be like exceptions to what we yeah. say like, but it's more of like the all right video is kind of very clear in what it's trying to say and what like it's trying to say the song is about but i still think it's really good and hasn't yeah. really affected i guess it's like that frontier psychiatrist isn't like the serious song where I want to like give myself room to imagine it. It's just like a fun little tune. So I like I really like that video. I kind yeah. of associate it strongly with the song. Yeah. I've actually never seen that video. I haven't seen any Avalanches stuff. I mean I've listened to their music and I love their music, but like just because of the nature of it, I always consider uh the record to be like just one long song. So yeah. I I didn't even know they had music videos. That video is fun. You should watch it. Um, I mean, I love music videos, so I'll have to look into it. Yeah, it's it's just like silly. It's fun. Um, and then also like I didn't put them on here, but Vampire Weekend does good videos, yeah. I think. Oh, yeah. As far as I remember, um, Oxford comma. The video for Step is like nothing, but it's also so perfect. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, and then and then the video for Diane Young is really fun and also perfect. Mm-hmm. Which one is like 
I think Oxford comma is like very yeah, it's just Wes kind Anderson. Of like, yeah. Very Wes Anderson y. It was directed by Richard Iowati, I think. Oh, yeah, oh, that's really? what it yeah. was. Oh, I knew that. I, I, I totally knew that. I, I, yeah, I really that's... liked it. Um... Because he, like, yeah, and you can see, like, there's a clear Wes Anderson influence in it, too. And, yeah, that's just kind of fun. I like Wes Anderson. Yeah. It has, like, it even has, like, the font, the Futura. Did you know that uh, he um, directed a music video for the Jack White Project, The Rock and Tours? I um, did not know this. Yeah, there, there are two music videos for. Um, I am a fan of The Rock and Tours. Yeah, I was um, a I'm big not, I'm supporter. I'm not like a huge fan, but I like them. What? Yeah. 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 I, I was saying that I used to be like obsessive about Jack White Projects, and it should be noted White Stripes have excellent music videos. Uh, Dead Leaves in the Dirty Ground is great. Um, obviously, Seven Nation Army is just like hypnotic. Um, they're great, but um, actually, Steady As She Goes has two music videos. One of them is directed by Jim Jarmusch, and one of them is directed by Wes Anderson, and that's just like the greatest thing ever. <laughs> Wait, what did you say? Wait, who are you talking about? Sorry, I just so out. Oh, the Tours. they're one of Jack White's bands. Um, Jack White of the White Stripes, along with... Uh, I didn't know that. Like, I love Jim Jarmusch and Wes Anderson. So yeah. You should, you should how watch How did both. I not know that? Like That's the, really cool. The Jim Jarmusch one is the most well-known one, um, and it's basically just them performing in, like, this old, weird barn, and there's, like... It's all shot, obviously, since it's Jim Jarmusch, it's all shot on, like, really old film. There's, like like shots of cows and stuff like that and then um the Wes Anderson one tells a story about um all of these like um little stock car racers and they're like um fighting to the bitter end to have this race it's funny because it's almost like um speed racer in a way except it's just like little wooden boxes with wheels and they're just like there's a villain and then there's the hero and that's Jack White and they're just like racing each other it's really funny Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. Did you want to talk about your favorite videos? Um, I mean, I have a. I personally really, really love music videos, um, uh, especially like some of the newer ones too, because I think it's given artists like just this perfect way to show what they want about their music and i really appreciate it there are tons of music videos i really don't care for um but i'm just personally good at like just good at weeding those things out of my mind that's just like something with me i'm good at forgetting things basically uh so i can just like throw bad music videos out pretty much um so there are a lot of artists that i really appreciate music videos from uh radiohead as we've mentioned all great music videos um i still listen to nirvana i still love nirvana and they have great music videos like heart shape box is possibly one of my all-time favorites and kurt actually planned everything for that video himself and wanted to get william burroughs to play jesus christ in that video which i really like um and then animal collective uh of the handful of videos they have, they're all like really weird and really great. Yeah. Animal Peaceful. Collective. Sorry, sorry, I'm interrupting you. Um, no, Animal no. Collective. This is really strange, but like I think I was talking about this before. Animal Collective is probably my favorite band, but I have barely seen any of their videos. Mm-hmm. It's because I don't really watch videos that much, and yeah. it's kind of weird. I've seen like I think after. I got yelled at a little bit about this in the podcast chat. I think, like, I revisited and I've seen... I've seen, like, uh, the My Girls video. That one's so fun. Um, Classic. Yeah. Just, like, cool visuals, basically. Who could win a rabbit? I've seen Brother Sport. Cool, visual, uh, cool visuals is kind of just their music for me. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. That's how it is for A.B. Tear since he has mm-hmm. synesthesia. So he actually is mostly writing his music for like his own visuals. That's how he bases it off. That makes so but much it, sense it, to me. Like, yeah. I, that's just that's perfect for them. I'm not I'm not even a huge Animal Collective fan, but like that's perfect. And then, like, I've seen Odd Sec, and that's it. 
Oh, that's but like that's... odd sack counts because it's like yeah. 50 minutes long and it's like, well, I mean, it's not a video. It's more like it's a, a, it's a, a musical film. Yeah, they call it a visual album, which is kind of pretentious, but I like it. Yeah. But yeah, yep. Animal Collective, Wait. like. Speaking of visual album, watch Motorcycle Jesus by Boots. Boots is um, the guy that did the hook um, for uh, Run the Jewels song early. early. And also, he did a lot of production for Beyonce's last album, I think. He's huh. done a bunch of other stuff. He's 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 pretty great. I mean, like, I don't. I think he's got a. I think he's got a lot of room to improve um, in terms of his songwriting. But like, I really like his sound. So I, I think it's worth a listen um, or a watch. It also, it was just a really interesting film to watch. But um, yeah, it was great. Uh, go on. You know what a good visual album is? Yeah. What? Trapped in the closet. Oh boy. <laughs> I still haven't oh. watched it, but I want to now that I know what it is. Did you, yeah. like, look into it all of it? I Basically, googled it and for, saw the Wikipedia okay. page. For anyone who doesn't know, Trapped in the Closet is R. Kelly's, like, 22-part um, album <laughs> movie, like, musical movie thing. And, like, Oh, I really don't want to spoil the plot, but I really do. I'm just, <laughs> just look it up if you haven't seen yeah. it already. It's like an hour and a half long. It's like straight up a movie. Can you like and watch it's it on just YouTube like, or something? Yeah, all the parts yeah. are on YouTube. That um, it's like, Keaton, have you seen it? No, I was, I was holding off in case we do um, something to watch it. All right, it's just, I've probably seen it like oh my god twice or three times it's straight up just like it's ridiculous it's amazing it's perfect um r kelly's a creep but like yeah. that that makes it just, for me though that's what I, if r kelly <laughs> wasn't a, a creep i don't think i'd want to watch it <laughs> yeah all right um just putting that out there okay anyways right. we um... can talk about indie music again yeah, uh, I was talking about Animal Collective. Peace Bone is a really, really weird video, and I love it. It's one of the things that got me into them. Um, uh, Who Could Win a Rabbit is a really screwed up video, and I like stuff like that, just surreal stuff. Um, and then, uh, like, LCD Sound System, we mentioned. Uh, All My Friends is probably one of my all-time favorite videos. And it's just James Murphy in this, like, weird face paint. Uh just totally i don't know he's he's just like singing and it's zooming out and it's beautiful um that's pretty much all i have oh arcade fire arcade fire beautiful music videos hold on guys i'll be right yeah yeah okay arcade fire does have like i really like the funeral videos uh specifically i don't specific have you not seen them i don't think so i think i've seen like see the thing about does Neighborhood One have a video? Yeah. Oh no, I don't want. See, the problem with that is like. It's it's okay. It's just the band playing with weird effects, like like weird colorful effects. It's not like, I don't know. Okay. It wouldn't like set an idea like, of the song in my mind. At least for at least for like Neighborhood One and for a lot of Funeral, probably like Neighborhood One is the most prominent example for me. It's just like such a personal um, thing for you no like such a visual song i guess like it's so yeah no like, i get I that i it, get that I that's a very visual clear... record for me and yeah for like <laughs> i can clearly like see are you okay sorry i um i accidentally just threw my phone over my bed and threw a very thin crack between my bed and the wall and it's gonna be a serious pain to get it out later but anyway you go on <laughs> yeah i identify with that a yeah. lot but like at least especially for neighborhood one probably just like it has such like strong visuals of like just like a little neighborhood like buried in snow yeah. and like tunnels connecting windows and it's just like 
trying to it's not quite like do... it's more figurative for me but like i get that yeah trying to do like i don't know that's just like a very personal thing for me because like uh i'm a person who is a enthusiast of secret passageways <laughs> but like <laughs> um for... i just don't yeah. want like i'm so scared of somebody else visualizing that for me i just don't want that to like yeah. be a thing yeah, I, get that. I don't know if for me it was always like not about it being literal but more so the gesture like wanting to be with someone so much that you'd like tunnel from your house through the snow all the way to their house and just be with them like that's such a beautiful image to me and i don't know i've always loved that song for that yeah yeah so this is kind of like a segue into our next point which is that like are music videos necessary and should artists feel obligated to make them and one of the artists i wanted to talk about during like when we're talking about, like, should artists feel obligated to make music videos, it's not Arcade Fire, although they were a pretty good example, but, like, I mean, at least in terms of, like, imagery, but, like, Neutral Milk Hotel. Yeah. Who, I don't think they've made a music video ever. I'm glad they haven't, and I don't think they should. Yeah. Yeah, no, it wouldn't work. And that's, However... like... It should be noted, members of Neutral Milk Hotel, notably uh, Julian Major Coster. Major Oh, well, yeah, that. Yeah. Um, but also um, Julian Coster, Scott Spillane, and a few other Elephant Six associates were in a, like, really unknown, not really well-circulated Bell and Sebastian video, which is pretty oh. cool. Oh, wow. I don't remember like... which one it is. It's off of The Boy in the Arab Strap. Also, the, like, Elephant Six culmination movie band thing major organ in the adding machine the i forget what it's called that's like their band name but like the it's just like a movie it's like a movie that they made where jeff mangum plays like a lobster it's so ridiculous and weird i love yeah. it so much um but anyways that's not what i was talking about <laughs> uh, <laughs> um so, like, I think Neutral Milk Hotel is, is, like, one of the, probably, like, the most prominent example of, like, an artist, to me, who hasn't ever made a music video. But, like, I also feel like it just worked for them, because I couldn't possibly imagine what a video for any of their songs would I be like. I think part of that, though, is, like, with the legend kind of surrounding the band and surrounding Jeff Mangum. Like, like if there's if there's any, like, kind of... Um, God, I, don't, I can't even think of a term for it, but, like, if there's any sort of, like, mysticism surrounding an artist that I still really prescribe to, it's, it's Neutral Milk Hotels. And it's not even, like... Like, I'm not... I don't listen to their music that much anymore. They aren't a big part of my life, but it's like this guy starts getting these panicked dreams about a Jewish family during the Holocaust and writes like uh, one album and no one knows who he is or who the band is and just slowly it grows until it's like this big legend. Like that's like, that's so interesting and it's like it's hard not to let me affect that and so i feel like everyone gets this idea of the music and also partially because of the imagery in the album it, it just being so intense and so detailed. yeah that's like it's mostly like... mostly what was what it was for me because all of their songs even from that album and from their other album on avery island and like their other songs too are all just like incredibly like just so specifically detailed and like uh, yeah kind of they're... are just like videos in your head at that point because they're just such like specific descriptions yeah. of like sensations and like just visuals i guess and 
Jeff Mangum's songwriting is very, very based on imagery. There's like all the, it's like all just these images that convey these different things. And like, yeah, how can you make a music video for something like Two Headed Boy Part Two, or it's like, uh, you know, um, God is a place where some holy spectacle lies. Like, there's no way, or even like Holland 1945, which is a much more, um, like listen to song i guess you could say like it's a one if they made a music video it'd probably be for that song um but it's like yeah you're singing about Anne frank but then all of a sudden uh now she's a little boy in spain playing pianos filled with flames like he's always switching that and that's a major proponent of why like they can't really ever have a music video in any way yeah i think i guess ultimately how i feel about this is that like I don't think it's necessary. I, I I wouldn't say that it's necessary for an artist to make mi- make music videos, but I think if they if they want to and they have a vision, they should be able to. Like, if Neutral Milk Hotel did make a video, I wouldn't object. I might choose not to watch it, but like, I don't know. I think obviously it should be. I would a be. Choice. I would be curious though. Yeah. Like, what would Jeff Mangum come up with to like compliment that? Music? Yeah, especially because How... it's been yeah. like it's been you know like twenty years. <laughs> uh, yeah. Like, like what would make He's him not be gonna like, do it. like after like, twenty years, know. all of a sudden he has this important thing to say? Yeah. No, I meant I meant like more after actually making in the airplane over the sea. Yeah. Like, yeah like... Me too. Now, <laughs> yeah. Like now, I'm trying to imagine. Him doing a video now because yeah. it kind of just seems like he doesn't want anything to do with any of that to a certain well, extent. He's playing it, and the last Not time really. I saw them live, he actually did seem happy to be there. Oh yeah, like, oh yeah, they they were all just explosive. Yeah, to me, like when I saw I didn't them. even enjoy the show that much. Like it was it was a good show, but it wasn't like it didn't blow me away. It wasn't like amazing to me, but like. I the one thing that I did really really appreciate is they all seem so very happy happy and grateful to be there playing in front of us at that very moment in time. Oh like, yeah. I don't yeah. even think it was quite that way. I, I saw them twice by the way. I don't even think it was quite that way the first time I saw them, and it was like, like I think part of the reason why I didn't have this mind blowing experience is because like that record is so personally tied to like the mysticism that surrounds it for me and all the imagery and just seeing it being played by like real people was really weird for me i guess but Mm. like i don't know i really loved how they were like they they were just so in the moment and happy to be there and that was so nice to watch yeah, I don't know. I'm. I honestly have to say it was like the opposite for me, but that has just as much to do with like the absolutely incredible show they put on from their standpoint as it did with like their environment because the uh, theater, the Wilma Theater that they played in, was like just the perfect setting for their music. Like I couldn't imagine anywhere that would be cooler than this like really, really, really old theater. Yeah. Um, and. That, that had to do with it. The crowd was just absolutely in love with it. Everybody was dancing, and it was just, like, so such a joyous experience. And, like, I, for you, like, you were into the mysticism, but for me, yeah. like, per, I just took it so personally. Yeah. Like, I listened to it and listened to it. I listened to it religiously for a very long time. So it was, like, it was a very personal, very human, just, like, gorgeous unbelievable record for me so like to see it played by them whereas you it felt like a disruption for you i don't don't know i don't know if it was a disruption i think part of it might have been like i watched it coming off of that record in a way like i I had already really spent my time with it and i don't want to say i'm never gonna listen to that album again or i'm never gonna have a great time with it or like really revisit it or listen to it a bunch of times like how i would but I just mean, like, I just mean, like, it was coming off a time period where that was, like, one of my records, you know, like, like, one of the albums that I was, like, deeply, deeply in love with and, and listened to regularly, so it was, like, it was, like, I think there might have been, I don't want to say disillusionment, but, like, yeah, it was, like, it was coming off of that time, and so it was just different for me. Yeah. But yeah. yeah. I guess a big thing it. about them is that they're like 
more at this point i'd say they're not as much as like like a band that's like making music and like touring but more just like a part of music history i guess so like seeing them is sort of like i i don't know yeah i get that like i saw the rolling makes it sort of divisive but i wouldn't know about seeing them because my friends decided to see the fray instead (laughs) (laughs) Um, i still can't believe that especially was that early when they started touring yeah this was like this was like last (laughs) summer like not this year, but like a year ago in the summer, they started touring at the end of 2013, and like they did a lot of their tours over the summer of 2014, and I didn't realize I that I would never be able to see them again until like after, after, like everything I, happened, and I couldn't take it, like I couldn't, um, go, and then they just it, never came back, and oh damn, so sad. <sighs> But I don't know. Personally, so my bad. experience with that band was just like one of almost like, and I hate to say it this way, but like worship. Like I was just in absolute awe of everything that was happening. And like they put on a damn good show. Like the way Julian is able to play multiple wow. instruments at once is just incredible. And Jeremy Barnes is just like such an erratic, like intense drummer. Yeah. And uh, Jeff when i saw him he was just wailing and his voice still sounded great and he was just like belting out everything with the you know the crowd was belting it too and it was just like uh to hear those lyrics played there and they played so many songs i didn't expect them to like they played little birds which uh is one of my favorite neutral milk hotel songs and like it's a dark song and i just like I was so into it, I just burst in tears multiple, multiple times throughout it. Uh, yeah. I don't know, that was the greatest concert of my life, but yeah, I don't I don't see music videos necessary, especially now that MTV has kind of gone away. Like, that was something that was very important to a band. If they wanted to be successful, they had to have videos in a way then, but now, yeah, I don't I don't see it as a very necessary thing. I, think, I don't I think, think it can artist... still be necessary for some artists. I think I think it's really it's really important for uh, uh, comedic musicians. Like like that's like the main like a huge selling point of Weird Al's music and of the Lonely Island's music. Like their videos are really important to them getting popular in the way they did and. Um, you know, them, like, staying relevant, I think. And I think it can be, in some ways, that way for pop stars, although increasingly less and less today. But, like, yeah. I think it's definitely still relevant in the comedy music world. Oh, yeah. It, it's definitely still relevant. Oh, of and, course like, it's the relevant. That... I just mean, like, it's definitely still critically important, in a way. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I see what you mean. Um, But, yeah, I... <laughs> I don't think an artist, and this is going to be, like, just very broad, but I don't think an artist should or is really obliged to do anything. Yeah. Um, that is, that's just the nature of the way art yeah, is, I, especially I something as intangible and, like, different as music and unique as music is, basically. Um, but, like... Just because it's still a staple of music, especially music in this culture in America, like it's now a tool for artists, and I yeah. think that's very exemplary. Uh, ex- ex- yeah, I think that's the right word. Um, with there's like Kendrick a Lamar's new video, all right. Like he definitely um, used it to his advantage and like put images of what was happening like post Baltimore and everything just like showed all these images that like represented his music well but still he wanted to like provoke something in people yeah yeah there's a big pattern of like I guess and just all artists in general to like put out like American artists at least like put out a single put out a video then like put out the album or maybe like put out another single put out another video um and it kind of just like for a lot of them I guess you could like it does feel like for at least at least one artist has to be like I don't want to do videos like why am I doing this yeah and like I still feel like 
even after like MTV or whatever. Like that's how music used to get out, but like it isn't anymore. I think. And with that, like that expectation is still here, and I just think it's sort of outdated at this point. Yeah. I. Mm-hmm. I don't. I. I'm not. I'm not sure how to totally connect this, but like, I think. I think sometimes. I think visual components are still important to selling music, and I'm gonna. I'm gonna talk oh, yeah. about uses for a second here. Um. Before uses came out, I was like. I wasn't a defender anymore, but I, I definitely didn't like hip hop music, and and I wouldn't have gotten into hip hop music if I hadn't been watching the Saturday Night Live episode where Kanye just flipped the fuck out on stage and put on, like, an intense, incredible uh, performance. And and at that time, I, 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 you know, I was, like, I was starting to, starting, like, I, I had already begun, like, I don't know, the process of kind of more discovering myself musically in a way. And, like, I, I loved it when artists, like, kind of, flip the fuck out you know <laughs> like like radiohead yeah. saturday night live performance you know like a decade earlier <laughs> um for kid a that was that was incredible and yeah. and just seeing that i was so in awe and it got me so excited and it got me into that music and hip-hop is one of my favorite genres now so i'm glad it happened but like i guess i'm saying like that also kind of sold the record for me and probably others in a way because like like i guess it really put out there the image of kanye kind of you know like going off the rails and putting out something more exper well experimental for him it, it's it's still experimental i hate it when people say like oh it's not experimental death grips are doing stuff like like just because just because yeah. there are other artists who are doing weirder things doesn't mean something isn't experimental like um, yeah, I mean that's a very industrial like inspired record, yeah. and like you can't really deny that from a musical standpoint. Um, but I guess my point is like in that way, um, a visual was really important to selling that record for me, and and I think I think the campaign where he just fucking projected his face onto skyscrapers performing like, <laughs> um, uh, one of the songs like it might have been New Slaves. Or something. I think like I think that was probably got him a lot of publicity too, cause that like I know I know that sold the least out of any of his records, but it sold more than it should have. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I think I think that was all a part of it. Um, just having such a intense like um original campaign in that way. And then also, like, I mean, it was obviously going to sell because it's Kanye, but, like, I think it sold more than it would have because of that. Mm. Yeah, I agree. Alright, anything to add? Guess? Um, um, I don't know. I don't know. I yeah, think we covered most videos. of it. Yeah. Yeah. We have pros to and me, cons it's... here, but, like, I think we talked about that. I think we covered yeah. that throughout, like, I guess. Yeah. I think um, after this, I'm probably going to start watching more music videos after hearing, like, your guys' thoughts. Yeah. I think, like, I, I don't really get excited about them, uh-huh. I guess. And I feel like that's something yeah. I might start turning towards. But yeah. for the most part, I just, like, like while I think it's cool to see, like, maybe the artist's own visual representation or maybe, like, somebody else's visual representation of the artist's music or, like, that song, I just don't know if that's for me because of the way I listen to stuff. Oh, yeah, but that's totally again, that's fair. just me. Like, everyone is their own person and experiences things in their own way. And and I don't know. I think, like, even... I don't know. I don't think you should base, like, what you do off of even a consensus or anything. Just, like, you know, be yourself. But, like, I think sometimes it's worth uh, looking into if you're yeah. a fan. Oh, yeah. Like, I, I don't... 
actively every time like an artist I like puts out a music video I'm not like hunting for it basically I don't like jump at it that much except for with like say Modest Miles um but like when there's a lot of talk about it and I hate to like be like such a hype hound or whatever but like when people it provokes something in people I'm definitely interested yeah and I definitely watch that video and that happened with the all right video like um and I'm very happy I saw that that happened with uh that Vince Staple video Vince Staples video that came out a while ago um, and I'm very uh I'm very happy I watched yeah. that that's the one where he they're just walking through and like he's carrying the bible up you know uh, what I'm talking no, about I don't know like, which video I don't think I saw hyped. it I don't know, but it was like it introduced me to his music, and it was just an incredible video that had a lot to say about um, the way the the kind of what's happening in the streets, so to speak, and like the way uh, white middle class people are kind of viewing it through a screen with uh, the media, um, and I think it was very relevant at the time he put it out because Baltimore was happening at that time. Um, he like put it out at the perfect time. Yeah. And I don't know that, that did a lot to me. And so I think music videos are definitely a relevant here art form. And we're in an interesting time right now because artists are really, really regaining them. Like that last Rihanna video, like that. Yeah. <laughs> that was I mean, nuts. the title screen, the title screen was taken from uh, a clockwork orange. Like nobody would be doing yeah. that earlier. That, that's what and, like, made me want to like <laughs> join into this conversation because I probably would have been like music videos. Eh, they're just music videos. I don't want to talk about that. But like, I thought, I don't know that that video was so interesting to me and made me think about like the possibilities. Cause that was such a change oh, yeah. for her to like, I, I she's oh, obviously yeah. been moving in a more gritty style from like, I don't know what she started off with like Ponda replay or umbrella, but like, I don't know. It was such a, it was like, it was interesting. <laughs> and it's, it's, it's exciting that there are more pop artists that can do stuff like this. Yeah. Like, you know, Kanye, Kanye is definitely an extravagant artist and, gritty and does like whatever he wants um but like now we're seeing rihanna do stuff like that and that's really interesting and exciting yeah. um and it shows that music videos are now a place where any artist whatsoever can put their own vision and like um really really express themselves in a way and in a weird way even though it's a tool of the industry and it was definitely a way the industry used to um kind of force the artists into doing a specific way for success and to get their own money because you know record labels need to make money now it's a way in a weird way for them to escape the industry and just put out something that is their vision and their vision alone and i really appreciate that and i'm very excited about that yeah, yeah. all right so that was the r slash indie heads podcast <laughs> uh good night or good morning, or whenever you're listening to this. Bye. Bye. Goodbye. JESUS!